first of all, the book was, was uh, we were thinking about making it 2007. It's about my dad and, and his, uh, all his sacrifices that he did for us, you know, and make us who we are today. As you know, we, I have all two other brothers, one of them is still playing. Uh, but it wasn't re really about baseball. It was, it was a, a love of a father, unconditional, you know, and, and he sacrificed so much for us. He, he did so many things for us. And, and this is like a tribute to him. And it's like, a, for me, it's like a winning a World Series or getting him into a Hall of Fame or something like that with this book. And he did so much for us. And obviously my mom, if I don't say my mom, she'll be mad, so. <laughs> so, uh, but, uh, but it's, it, this is what it's about. Um, I hope you guys enjoy it for sure. Uh, we enjoy it and my mom enjoyed it. She finished it like a week ago and hopefully, uh, hopefully you guys get a chance to uh, enjoy it. It's pretty nice, you know. Uh, I don't know what else to say without spoiling you guys' book. So if you guys have any questions, we can just go ahead with the questions. It's fine. Any questions you guys think about baseball? You play ball? Yeah? He's a catcher. He's a catcher, huh? <laughs> See, you must have a lot of questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. thing. Did, did you choose to play catcher, or did that make you no, my dad actually never forced anybody to play ball, uh, a position, any positions. He never, he never did. He just, uh, um, he tried to find you uh, a way, like the bigger guys were catchers, the skinnier guys were, or faster guy were shortstop, second base, center field, and the tallest guy was a third base, my first base, things like that. But he, but he never forced anybody to do it. Um, he just let you play, teach you the whole game, uh, starting from bunting and to hitting and everything, so. But it was never forced. So I have a question. So, why is your hand play catcher? When is it the time that you sort of sort of get it figured out, all the things that you have to, what age do you sort of get it figured out, all the things you have to be thinking about as the catcher to run the game? You know, like, what are you um, going to decide? I'm going to throw down the second, second, or throw the third, or throw the first, or what am I going to do if this happens? When you start to put all that together and it makes sense to you. I would say 15, 16 is when you first probably start thinking ahead. Um, baseball is a very interesting deal because anticipation is huge. If you don't have it, it's, baseball is going to come to you quick and you're not going to make it, you know. So if you, uh, let's say you're running at second, I mean any, any, any situation goes. If you're running at second and the ball's hit to the right side, you know you have to advance, but if it hits to the left side, you hold on with nobody out, things like that. But in, in his head, he has to have that play and play and play. So when it happens, you know how, how to react. So that's what I mean by anticipating. It's a huge word for, for baseball players. And I think 15, 16 is when they start doing all that. You know, at least in the Puerto Rican level, that's when I started doing it. That's when all my friends started doing it. And the game became easier because you kind of you kind of knew almost what was going to happen next, you know? And it became fun. But he's, he has a way, so I think uh, he just needs to go out there and have fun. And uh, the worst, the worst thing that we can do as parents is uh, the yelling, the, the forcing him to do something. Why do you struck out? No, why instead of if he struck out, why why instead of saying why did you struck out, why not ask him what are you gonna do next? And, and avoid that negative on their on their brain. So I think I believe a lot on that. I believe that if you stay positive. Uh, on the kids, uh, they advance even more. I think that's the key. He'll be fine. <laughs> Who's your favorite starting pitcher to catch? Um, uh, I got three of them. You know, I I like Roy Holiday. I I cut him for one year. I didn't have too many, too much time to enjoy him, but he was he was a beast. He was good. Uh, Lincecum and the Giants was. Very good. Uh, we, we worked out very good together. 
and uh, and Cliff Lee at the end of my career when he went traded to uh, Texas. He was one of the biggest biggest pitchers I ever caught because uh, he put the ball wherever whatever we you know we were trying to do. He knew what we were trying to do, and he put the ball where he wanted to. So it was a lot easier that way. If you weren't a catcher, which, which position would you want to play? I love playing center field. I love playing shortstop. Uh, I love to pitch. I did, I did okay in college. Obviously, that was my first time pitching. I got hit a lot the first year. But the second year, I kind of figured it out a little bit. So I was a lot better. And when I was a pitcher in college, uh, I faced good hitters. I faced Polo Duca. I faced George Arias. I faced uh, all those big guns, Paul Conerco, and all those guys that were in college at that time. So I faced them, and it was a good experience for me. But God, I guess, had another plan for me, and <laughs> being another catcher. And, but I, I would love to uh, probably pitch. Uh, that would be my best, even if I, I'm afraid of getting hurt. But. <laughs> But I'll, I'll be my best. What are you doing now that you're out of baseball? Um, uh, baseball takes a lot of time away from your family. Mm -hmm. A long time. So I coached two years, past two years. This year I'm having it off. I'm working on the book tour and all that, trying to get my dad's message out there. Um, and then we're working on the script. It's going to be a movie. so. Uh, that's going to take a little bit of time. Maybe in the future go back to coaching, because that's what I like to do. But the major league level is very tough. It's, um, it's a lot of guys getting paid a lot of money, and they don't look at you as a teacher. They look at you as a, well, what are you talking about, you know, like that. So uh, we, we're we going to open a Molina baseball for kids. Uh, we're trying to do it everywhere we can. But we're going to probably start with five of them, and then we go from there. It's not a necessarily academy, but, but it's more to teach kids the right way to play ball, you know, and, and without having, you know, those, like I see these days, having coaches that start yelling at them, and they think that's the best way, and the kid's just f frozen out there. Uh, but we're going to teach them the right way to, to play the game and, and be all right. So, I'll be busy for the next couple of years, and then come here and crab and and tramping and <laughs> king salmon fishing. Oysters. Huh? Oysters. Oysters. Ooh, I love them. So, oh, we'll be busy. What do you think is the attribute that makes a good catcher? I mean, you've got three, three, your siblings are. What, what's the thing about it that makes you a good catcher? Um, it's hard to put it in one word, but. If I got to put it in one word, it would be caring. You have to care about your pitchers. You have to care that they do well. You just can't have to go out there and say, OK, fastball, and OK, curveball. You know, like, you have to care. You have to, obviously, you have to have the mental toughness to be catcher, because you really get hurt. And you have to play hurt. You know, a catcher is probably the only guy that plays with only 75% being good on your body every single day. Everybody else is 85, 90, close to being all right. But the catcher is always, it's always tough. So mental toughness um, and caring, you know, caring about your pitchers, caring about your teammates, trying to make them better every day. I think that's, that's what we have. So any, any work for us. What advice, do you know our uh, catcher Zanino? What's that? Do you know our the Mariners catcher Zanino? Mm -hmm. What advice would you give him now? Because uh, he's had, he has such a horrible batting average. What would you tell well, him? Well, it's, it, it, it's not his fault. No, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> what would you, how do you, I mean, right? you know, how, how, but how long, I mean, the reality is a team can't, with those kind of numbers, audience and all, can't carry someone. Believe Remember, me, I. With uh, his batting, what would you tell him? How would you? Get uh, to I don't know. Maybe the catching part is taking a toll on him. Maybe the catching is getting him a little bit slower, tired. Who knows? Maybe go to first base. Maybe he's fresh, mm -hmm. and play better and start hitting. But um, 
um, it's probably just the Mariners' fault because they may be, they may be pushed, put him up, you know, and he might, not, he might end up being ready. When I was in minor leagues, if you didn't hit 280 or more in the minor leagues, you, you never touch big leagues. And, and you have right now guys hitting 220, and they're up in the major leagues. 220 in the minor leagues, what's that tell you? How is he going to be in the major leagues? At least a 280 guy, 85, uh, it gives you a little hope that he might hit 250. But when you see guys like that, it's, it's very sad because you, they're good kids. But that's not the point. The point is that the Mariners are committed to the town to win a championship. And if they're going to have a guy hitting 190 as a catcher, and they don't do nothing about it. I wish it were 190. <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? It's, it's, it's hard to watch. I mean, when, when I was in the Angels, they, they let me go. They didn't want to sign me free agent because they have Jeff Mattis. And Jeff Mattis' career average is 195. Mm -hmm. And I was like, wow, I, I bring you a little more than that. And, you know, and, and you still didn't want to sign me, but they wanted to save money with him. And with Sonino, I think it's like he was so hyped up. And in college, he did good. He had a good college career. But once you get to the big leagues, man, it's kind of sad, actually, to watch. It's real sad because he's not the only one. That's what I'm trying to say. Mm -hmm. I'm not dogging him. It's just that he's not the only one. There's, go around and look, at, look around all the catchers that are hitting 210 or something like that. It's hard, man. It's hard to have him out there, especially for a fan. Well, am I going to go see this guy hit? I mean, we know what is going to happen, you know? So you just got to hope that. And then if he's, if he's a catcher, like, uh, like he's winning games, catching, uh, doing shutouts, and, you know, helping the pitcher like that, I, I will take 150 or whatever, their first place. Or, mm -hmm. But that's not even happening either, you know? So it's hard to, hard to say, but I think it's not his fault. I think it's just the Mariners fault that they can find somebody that hit 250 in the major league level. 250. They cannot do it. What current catchers do you enjoy watching? Um, in the receiving part, not necessarily the hitting. The receiving part, I enjoy my brother. I think he's one of the one of the few genius out there, right, calling the game, and he knows what he's doing. He's, he's really, he knows. Uh, Salvador Perez is one of my favorites. Um, and if you know, it's because he cares. They care. They want to win, and they do whatever it takes to win. And that's what I love. Those two catchers right now, Buster Posey is not necessarily a catcher, even though he does a great job with the pitching. But he's, for me, he's not a... He's back and forward, right? Like a first base catcher. So, but um, but that guy is, uh, those two guys for me are, are probably the best right now. So, what do you personally think about the new trends in baseball? You know, with, with regards to how pitching has developed throughout the last say 10, 15 years. I mean, what do you think the field is at, and how do you think baseball is going to change in the next 10, 15 years? Just from your professional experience. How the pitching is going to change? Pitch, what is in general the game, but I, I always thought pitching has become very interesting in the last five years. Um, uh, it's hard to tell how, where, where they're going because like what I said, it's, mm -hmm. it's a lot of young guys that don't belong. And the, and the angels or whoever, oh man, this is my first round pick. There we go. It goes up to the major leagues. Now, without any experience, like I said, when you go, when, when I was playing, that kid had to have three years in the minors, at least, before he touched a major league field. Which right now, even if you gave up whatever, that's your first round pick. Was that he has to go. I mean, was that all teams that required that they be in the minors? For three years? Yeah, you can see it. When I, was, when I was in the minor leagues, I always look at the papers. I always look at everybody else because yeah. I wanted to be compared with my same type of catchers. Mm -hmm. or, and I'm sure the pitchers did the same, but, but it wasn't given. Mm -hmm. These days, 
you sign this year a first round pick, now they sign in a contract in September, you have to be in the major leagues no matter what. But how? He, didn't, he haven't done anything. You know, and, and that's very sad, but it's, it's this truth. You know, that's why you see all, all kinds of guys hitting um, 200. I mean, uh, and, uh, and, I, and I'm also talking about Harper, which right now everybody's seeing, oh, yeah, Harper is the best now. Yeah, but how many years took him? Yeah. I wish they would have given me that chance, four years to, or three years in the major leagues to practice and get ready. I wish they would have got me that time, you know, but, but that's what's happening right now. You know, you sign for first round and they think they're ready and they throw them out there. You know, another thing is the pitching, they throw so hard and you go up. So if you throw 100, 95 plus, 100, you go up. It's very, it's very difficult for a guy like me that, that had it really rough, you know, and, and it's very difficult. I keep hitting this, right? <laughs> I think it's better, right? No, but it's very difficult for me to watch that because I saw many of my, my friends in the minor leagues battling it, battling it, and they had a 250 ERA, which is pretty good. Uh, even a 3.0 is very good in minor leagues, but they never had a chance. So, and then you see these guys signing for a big bonus and before you know it, they're in the major leagues throwing wild, but they are in the major leagues because they throw hard. They don't, they don't like the 88 miles an hour pitchers that, that controls the ball. They don't like those guys. <laughs> <laughs> because they, they get people out, they know how to get people out. But the guys that throw 95 and you don't know where it's going, they get them in the major leagues. And it's very sad, but that's the way it's going. Like you said, that's the way it's going. So be ready for the right. <laughs> See, like you guys have one, Rodney. Yeah. He throws very hard. He throws all over the place. Yeah. He, he gives everybody a heart attack, <laughs> and then he saved the game. <laughs> it happens. He's a good guy, though. Yeah. No, it, we see it, it has nothing to do with their personalities. It's, no, it's, it's what they can do. do. It's what they, how they can. Yes, that's exactly right. It doesn't matter. They could be a great person. They could be Christian. They could be whatever. But if they can do the job, why is he there? That's what I don't understand. So when you were a kid, what percentage of the time were you practicing baseball? I mean, was it year-round, every day, five hours a day? or did was kind of did other things and baseball was just something you did. So that's the first question. How much did practice the time you were like 10 or 11 does it take? I mean, did, did you have to do to get to be to a major league level? And the second question is, when people talk about why, why is um, Felix Hernandez, I can't figure out why he's such a good pitcher. I mean, wh what is it? He doesn't throw really hard. He doesn't seem to have some, like you can think of Randy Jones that could throw a fastball really hard and he had a slider and he had stuff. That I cannot figure out why a pitcher like, or Jamie Moyer or Felix Hernandez is so good because they don't seem to have overpowering physical talent. Well, the first one, the practice is, is what made me and my brothers who we are. And I'm gonna tell you why. Every single day since I was four, I've been on the baseball field. I live across from the baseball field. So for us, my dad went to work, as you guys are gonna read it. He went to work early and then came back at four, uh, got something to eat. <coughs> By five, we were all at the stadium. So we are three. So me, I was in, uh, let's say, Monday and Tuesday, or Monday, Wednesday. Jose was Tuesday, Thursday. Then Yari or me, even us, we were on Friday. We didn't have nothing to do, so we went out there to the field and play ball with the kids or practice. Saturdays and Sunday, we had double headers. So it was like every day for many years, every day on the field. And when we had off, obviously it rained a lot. We had rained outs. We, we pick a, a ball and um, like a newspaper, we put tape and we play with the broomstick right in front of the house. We're throwing curveball, we're throwing everything we can. And so I think 
that's what made us who we are. We practiced so much. We, we were on the field so much. And our, our parents didn't have to tell us, hey, go practice, man. Go out. We had a lot of self-motivation. Like, we wanted to be out there. We weren't thinking about major leagues. We're so young. We didn't think of that. We didn't even dream about being this, this way. But I think by practicing that many days, it made us better, you know, the whole time. Um, uh, and Felix, I always call that the ghost pitch. And, and he throws one of those because, many of those, I should say. But <laughs> the reason they don't hit him is because he, he make pitches look strikes. Right? He makes them look strikes, but when he gets to the plate, there's a ball. For us, as hitters, whoever play the game, you only have so short time to react. And if, if out of the hand that ball comes to you as a strike, then you're going you're gonna to gear up. You're going to swing because you only have that short time. So, but then at the end, he has the advantage because that ball disappeared on you. So he got that sinker, which sinker, cutter for him. A split finger or a change. See how he goes away and down. And then he has that ball that throws hard. He doesn't throw slow or he throws 92. So all those four spots is what you need. A lot of pitchers that get hit have the opposite. Instead of going away from the plate, they go into the plate. And that's the ones that get hit. You know, like he's throwing away and the ball comes into the middle. He's going away, middle. You know what I mean? He throws a changeup and he doesn't do the ghost. He goes right down the middle. That's the one to get hit. So he throws those good, any good pitchers you've seen, like Kershaw. He throws that ball caught in from this angle, but he lands right on the corner. So for a hitter, that's a ball. Because you're watching it this way, it's a ball, and then all of a sudden, it gets right to the plate. And you're like, you know, you have no time. So. It's the same with the pitch inside. It's different things. I mean, I can go on and on, but, <laughs> but it's different. It's a, it's a cutter. I mean, the ball that goes away, the pitcher that dominates that ball is the better pitchers. They make it look strike, and then you don't have a chance. So when you were catching, did you have to, when you say carrying a bag, did you have to study every hitter and like, think about a play? I mean, how do you decide what to call? for particular hitters and then there's a second and third time to the play. I mean, how much work before a game do you have to spend <laughs> thinking about what you're going to call? Well, we, we spend a lot of time in the video room uh, with our notebook. Um, first of all, they give us a book this big for their pictures because I got a hit too. So I got to know their pictures, but also they give us another book with their hitters. So while everybody's sleeping in the plane, um, <laughs> we're with our notebook looking at notes. What does this guy like to do? Two two count. He likes the fastball. He hates the curveball. O oh, two count. He's hitting O oh, fifty with the curveball, or, or whoever, whatever pitch. But but you know we write it down. That's that's a that's a big write. And then all of a sudden when we go before the first game of the series, everybody talks about the pitchers and how we're gonna pitch to them, and then you bring your notes. But it's a lot of work. My brother, Yadier, he spends an hour and a half uh, writing stuff and, and noticing little openings on the swing and all that uh, before every series. That's why you see the success. Because he's, he's, he spends the time, you know? Uh, I did that a lot. I had to do it, and we, we still have it at our house. We still have the books. Uh, it's a lot of information, but you try, to, you try to keep so much in your head because it's going to help your team. Like when we faced the Dodgers, the key batters was uh, Adrian, well, the Padres. Adrian Gonzalez was the key. You don't want to get beat by him. Uh, in this team, let's put the Mariners up. Uh, you don't want to get beat by Cano or Nelson Cruz. If you get beat by Morrison or Seeger or whatever, but, well, you're okay. So you study all those fours because those are their main ones. So you want to try to get those guys out no matter what. And then you battle with the, the rest of them. So it's, it's a lot of thinking. It's, it's not easy for a catcher. 
But, um, but you just hope the pitcher does his homework too. And then it makes it easy for you. Like Lincecum never watched a video. <laughs> <laughs> he never watched a video. He was sitting down in the chair watching TV until 15, 15 minutes before the game. He all got out, throw a few balls, and he was ready. But uh, at the beginning, he started shaking me off. And, and uh, I didn't like that because I was the one watching the videos. And he, didn't, he never watched any videos. So why are you shaking me off? And we had a discussion, and, and I told him, I said, if you want to shake me off, I want to see you in the video room watching what you're doing. And if you don't, don't shake me off. I mean, I'll call the game, and then you go by me. And he was fine with it. You won two Cy Youngs, right? <laughs> so he was fine. But it's a lot of work. It's not easy to, to be a catcher. And, and, and to be a catcher is actually easy, like you guys we were talking about. But to be a successful one, it's not easy. It's a lot of work. Did he win the two Cy Young Awards while you were catching him? Yes. I, didn't, I don't think I missed one, one start with him. I think I had them all. Were you we were all good. Were you ever involved with the perfect game? No, I was. I think I caught like seven or eight one hitters. But I never caught an all hitter or a perfect game. Or I was close, but. I, I saw Seager's, I mean, uh, Felix's perfect game. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't understand why they got rid of John Jaso. Jaso had an average far better than his. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, he's not a. They might not think he's not as good a catcher as a oh, Sunino. Yeah. And and here we go again. Like if the office think that Sunino is the. <laughs> it don't matter what we think and what we see. Right. It's what they're what they're thinking. And if they think he's the man. You guys are gonna have to eat him up over there. You know. So it's it's up to the. The main ones. GM. Yep. Mm -hmm. They like him. A lot of them. A lot of them. They get drafted by that GM, so it's hard for the GM to do something else mm -hmm. because his pride. Does you that know. Happen a lot? Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. wow. I seen it, especially my last two year coaching. Yeah. I saw it so many times. I saw it, and I. Uh, that was one of the toughest things to do after you're a player. Go to coaching because you hear all about all these players and. I was like, wow, I wonder what they had to say about me. <laughs> wow. So it was pretty tough. It was pretty tough. But, but no, that's what's happening right now. You know, all the young kids, they think because they're first rounder, they need to be up. And I saw many first rounders never made it. They're churning out so many. I mean, it's almost like a meat grinder. Yeah, they, they also, another thing that we got to see is that they pay a lot of players a lot of money and they have to even it out in the bottom. Instead of having a, a great catcher that doesn't hit so well, but he's gonna do well in catching and not paying much, they, they, they pay Cano, they pay Cruz, they pay all these guys a bunch of money, but then they have to even it out somewhere. And then they can't do nothing about it. You know, you can, you know, the Yankees, you know, the Yankees can, can spend. But Seattle, I don't think they go that far, but but that's what happens. A lot of times that's what the key is. It's what they think in up top. Is they think that's the guy. 120 have to do it. So do you ever miss it? I mean, miss being on the road with the guys and the different cities and the different fields? And um, to tell you the truth, uh, a year and a half maybe I missed it. I wanted to be back. I wanted to play. But after that, no, I don't, I don't miss it. I, I actually remember so it's hard, man. It's hard not only on the on the family, but but it's hard to. It's a competition every day, and then when you start getting older, 35. I mean, they start getting you out, and it was rough for me. I had 20, 20 home runs my last year in '09, 20 home runs and no big league job next year. I had to fight with the Giants to so give me another year. I fight for them. And that was just because of your age? I think because they had a young guy. I mean, obviously Posey was going to be great, but I could have been there helping him. Mm -hmm. uh, if anything, other teams didn't have a catcher. Like Milwaukee at that time didn't have a catcher. Um, Kansas City was still two years, three years away from, from Perez, things like that. So I could have fit in for one or two more years, but they, they never... <laughs> 
they never call, you know, they never wanted that, you know, I think it's, it's, it's weird. So you start getting upset, you start getting really down on yourself, really doubting yourself that you can play and, and you just go out, you know, like, I've seen a bunch of guys do that. Mm -hmm. They go out of baseball bitter, you know, because baseball wasn't great to them later when they were doing good. Like, like I said, you know, I hit 20 and I didn't have one call for a major league job the next year. Well, it doesn't have anything with being fair. That's the first thing you got to get in your mind. Mm -hmm. It's not about fairness. No, nope, it's not about fair, and, and what, that's why it makes it hard for us. Because yeah. we understand you know, it's not fair. Yeah. And, and we, well, we don't want to <laughs> go through that. We want to be that lucky guy. We want to be that, I can mention names, but <laughs> I'm not going to. But, but we could be that lucky guy that give him $55 million for one good year. You know, for five years, and then he, he had one good year, get paid, five years, nothing. I wanted to be one of those. But it, it doesn't happen that way, like you said. It's, it's, it's not personal, and it's, it's all business. Mm -hmm. But it's hard for us, you know? Is it hard for a player to be on a team that has um, their colleagues making so much more? I, I, I just use Canelo. You know, it's two hundred and forty million dollars for ten years or nine years. And you're only and you are maybe even a lot better. And you're just making a fraction of that a year. How do players um, look at that? We don't we don't see it that way. We see that Cano has been has been an anchor for the Yankees, which is not easy. He's been doing great. Last year he had a great year. This year he's struggling. And you could be better than Cano for a month. But what happened to the other years? You didn't do crap. Yeah. Like for me, I can't compare myself to those guys because I might have good years, but mine's were as good as those guys. It's like Pujols, everybody were all over him because he couldn't hit last past years. He was hurt. But everybody's, why are they paying? Why are they paying? Well, they paying because 10 years, he hit 30 homers, hit over 300, uh, RBI's 100, uh, runs score 100. Ten yeah, but, years. Yeah, but what if he flames out, though, over that, I don't know what their contract is, and it, mm -hmm. just, it just goes down from there? That's I mean, what... That's the problem. But, uh -huh. People like us in exactly. the stands look at that and say, yeah. are you crazy? But, is that, but it, the, that's not the, the Pujols problem. That's the, the owner I know, it's that came out to him and say, hey, yeah. listen, I'm going to pay you for what you did. Yeah. I don't care what you do. And no, then he no, might have two, sense. he might have two, three more good years. But like you said, he's getting up there. He's getting 36, and then next year he's going to be 38, yeah. you know? So, and, and I understand. Perfect. I, but it's the owner. They want to do that somehow. How are you going to pay a guy 41? You're going you're gonna to pay him $20 million. When you know at that time he starts slowing down. So... I never understood, but it's like a -Rod. Everybody hates a -Rod because they gave him $275 million. Uh, it's not his fault. No, the the owner... I don't have a problem with it. No, no, I'm saying guys. like everybody else. Like a lot of people that I yeah. hear at the stadium, they always say the same thing. It's not his fault. I always put a sample. My dad was one of them. He couldn't stand a -Rod. but But it was because... He blamed a -Rod for that. And I'm like, Dad, it's, it's not a hey man. Yeah. It's like if you're, he's a factory worker, excuse me, if he's a factory worker, he's getting $1 million a year, and here comes General Electric and pays him $4 million. Where are you going to go? I don't care. I'll learn how to do it. But I'm going to go with this guy. So it's the same for a player, you know? We might not sometimes deserve what we get, but we're, they're willing to pay us that money and then deal with that later, you know what I mean? So, it's the owners, the Is owners. Is there ever going to be a ceiling on all this? I mean, who's going to, it's like, like Kershaw, who's going to say Kershaw is not going to go down in five years? But they give him $300 million, something like that. I mean, it's crazy how the owners do it. If I were the owner, man, I, I'll give a, a maximum of five years Four or five years. And I was a player. No, I so want more. But so if you were a GM, you would never give a player, you would never hire a player for more than four or five years. Is that right? I, I, think, I think it's fair. Five years. 
I think it's, it's really fair for everybody, for himself too. Mm -hmm. Because in five years, if you, don't, if you really do good in five years, you're still going to get paid more than yours. But if you don't do good, it's actually good for the team because they can go and get somebody else and things like that. So I think it's just fair. I'm a player, believe me. I, I used to play, so if you give me 17 years and I'm 50 and I'm still trying to play, <laughs> you know, bring it on. I'll, I'll play. But, but if I'm an owner, I'll be careful with those because you never know. I have known you since my son was 12. And it was actually a really rough time in his life when I actually met Jamie and he was playing for a coach that was extremely derogatory towards him and he was extremely frustrated and up until that point he had played catcher, had always been on an all-star team and that kind of stuff. What advice do you have for little kids that get that coach? Because you totally changed my son's world. Well, I think uh, it's, uh, it's a tough deal for, for the kids. Very tough. I think it's the parents' decision on finding a, a team that the kid can develop himself. If if that coach have to yell that much to him, that means he's not getting better. Because if he was doing the good things, like uh, you know, getting better and hitting better and running better and all that, he don't have to yell. Mm -hmm. So if he find a, a guy like that, I think he's better off just find another team and. You know, and, and trying to find that. I mean, you're never going to find a perfect coach, of course, but, but at least somewhere comfortable for your kid, because that's what you want. You don't want, and I always, I always tell her, my wife, and I always say, listen, I want to give the kid a chance. I don't want to take that chance away. And by yelling, they're taking a chance away. So I want to give that, ch that kid a really good chance to succeed. And, and if I see, if I had a son, and I see the guy yelling, he ain't playing there. I don't care what I had to do. That's why I brought Jamie with me to the games. <laughs> I, don't, I don't care what I had to do, but I'm gonna look for him for a good team, for a guy that cares, nice. and, and a guy that, that is gonna teach him the right way. He's gonna take care of him, you know? And a lot of times you see, guys out there coaching because they have a son. They play shortstop, fourth batter, right. pitch the second game, right. you know? <laughs> yep. Have it all beauty. Yep. Um, but that's not the way. That's why I love, I hope you guys enjoy the book because that's why my dad did. He didn't care about the winning part. Mm -hmm. He wanted to develop players. Right. And, and a lot of them went through it. I don't know if you guys know Jose Rosado, mm -hmm. Valentin, both of them. Yeah. Jose Hernandez, Pudge. Bernie William, Putch, Rodriguez. Mm -hmm. They all went through my dad's system. So, I mean, it's because he cared, man. He, he, he was awesome. He, he cared about you and he wanted you to be better. He don't care about making it, whatever it was, but he don't care about that. He don't care about winning. We didn't win a championship. I played with him since five. And we didn't win a championship until I was my last year, 15. That was my first championship. And right now it's, it's all about travel ball and having guys going out here, okay, yeah, we gotta win this tournament. How about the kid, man? How about those kids trying to learn how to hit a cutoff man or how to, how to know where they have to be, cover first, and you know, so when they get to high school, they don't, they don't look at you like, what, what do I do now? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the main thing, I think. You gotta find a coach and you hit it where it is, you know, you have to find a coach that uh, at least it fits the best for your kids, and that's what it is. That's why I want to do my Molina baseball, is because I want to help them have a chance. And I might not be able to help the whole world, but I'm going to try to help a few, you know? Hopefully you help a few. So your brother's going to help you with the, with the coaching once they... Um, Jose, Jose wants to. Yadi, Yadi's pretty busy. He's, he's doing his thing. He's still playing, and, but, but Jose might. We might do uh, a bunch of clinics everywhere, which Seattle is included. So we're gonna do a bunch of clinics, and not only for the kids, we're gonna we're gonna teach the co uh, coaching. Like, there you go. We're gonna, right gonna invite here. we're gonna invite the coaching in, and yeah. we have a, a, a meeting, and mm -hmm. this is what we believe how it should be, and they'll take whatever they want from it, and but at least they hear it, you know, in every aspect. That's a good help. <laughs>
your your younger brother is really 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 good. Um, how, <laughs> how, how much how much credit do you and Jose take for that? Like, you um, <laughs> if you talk to Jose, Jose will, will take all the credit. <laughs> but talking to me, I um, you know what is uh, for me it was very important growing up, and uh, you guys see uh, the air um, as a as a grown up good player, the best. But I see him like like that kid right there. You know, I see him young, growing up, and and I was always the oldest one. So I wanted to be a role model for him. I wanted to to do the right thing for him. I wanted to not drink, not smoke, not go out to parties. Um, I wanted to be that guy because I knew they were right behind me. And they were looking at what I did. So I wanted to be that guy that felt good, like right now we were talking about it, and I feel good about what I did, because I, I thought I did pretty good with him. I'm not taking the credit of how good he was. I'm not saying that, but, but at least inside, inside of him, we know how good a person he is. And he has a great heart, he's very humble, stayed on the ground and everything, so I, 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 can, take, I can take credit for that, but, but not the, the game. He worked so hard for what, what he's done. He, he's done it himself, but um, he probably saw us growing up and wanted to follow us, you know? But he's, he's an amazing, amazing hard worker, man. In spring training, uh, what time did I, I got there by 5.30 every day, spring training. And he was already with the gear on, sweating, blocking balls. When I got there, I was just getting ready to change. And he was out there in the cage with all the young guys, because he'll take the young guys too. He, he'll tell me, if I make it here at 4, 4.30, you gotta make it here at 4. <laughs> so he took all the young guys and, and they were out there working hard, but, but look at how it paid off, you know? It pays off. He has three gold, not gold, now they make a platinum glove, man. I mean, that's the best defender of all of them. The best defender in both leagues. I mean, that's, that's pretty sick, man. So, but he, he um, he deserves it. He, he's worked so hard. And that's why he's so good. Any other ones? Hey, it's your chance, man. <laughs> Here's your chance. I have a question about, um, I have a, well, is being honest more important than having, um, and having the right call so that your team in your team's favor, which is more important because I think it's well, I believe it's honesty, but some people like on my team don't. So I just wonder about that. So let me, let, me, let me explain this. So <laughs> he was in a game and I think he was playing third, and he took a throw and he he. So I think the umpire maybe thought he tagged him out, and he said. No, he told the umpire, no, I didn't tag, I missed the tag. And I think his coaches maybe didn't tell him, that's not your job, don't go make, don't go admitting that you didn't do that. So that's what he's trying to get at. You're, you're in the right track. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything about that. I mean, you're in the right track. I mean, being honest for me, um, it's, it's huge. You have to be honest. But in that case, it's not your position to change a call. How many times I had a guy out at home and the ref called him safe? But it's not my position. I mean, I try to change it, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but, but no, you're in the right spot. I think being honest is great, but you have to understand the game. You can't be going out there saying, I didn't tag him like you said, or, or I'm sorry, um, I didn't touch the base or something like that. You can't go like that because that's not the game. The game is playing ball and that's why they have referees, that's why they have umpires. It's because of one of those, you know? But being honest is, is the best way. Our dad taught us to be honest the whole way. He said, you do or die being honest. And you're not gonna be you're not gonna be messed up or you're gonna be you're not gonna do the wrong thing if you're honest. That's just put it that way. Uh, but the game you have to, it's like basketball, like that commercial where they show the kid and, they, and the kid goes to the ref 
hey, that's it's their ball or something like that. But but it's not his position to do that. The the, the ref and the amp they call the game how it is, you know, and, and you you can't do nothing about it. But you're on the right track, man. You you follow that, and then your heart will grow. That's for sure. So you already mentioned that playing catchers very physically demanding on your body. Do you or your brothers? Did you guys? Do you guys do anything to help your hands or or like your shoulders or your arms when you're constantly getting hit by baseball or constantly catching on and off our pitches and stuff like that? Anything special? Uh, for the hands, no. Uh, you pay the price later uh, when you retire. <laughs> but but it, when you're in the game, you don't think about it. You know, you, you just want to catch. You just want to do good for your body. Uh, after every game, you go out into a top full ice, and you try to and, and pray that that helps you. <laughs> um, the hot before the game, the cold after the game, uh, is how you stay fresh all those games. Uh, but the part that uh, people don't know is like when, this, when the World Series is over, and if you didn't make it to the World Series, you're already a month mm -hmm. off. You take another month or maybe a half a month off, and then you start working out until February where you start your, your spring training. So for us, it was year round. Um, for me, I started at 9.30. Finished by 11:30 or so, or 12, uh, on the in the gym. Took a little rest, and by four o'clock we were on the field. So we practiced twice a day, every day, even Sundays. So and that's what the part that people don't understand and don't know that, that we we put our time in. It's not easy, you know. Of course we uh, we get good money and all that, but we still we still practice hard, you know. We still go do our thing. At least we did as, as brothers. We took pride on that, you know? <laughs> no, don't say that. <laughs> oh, no. well, before we finish, I want to say something real quick. Um, I want to finish by saying what my dad said to us. Uh, and I always finish this way, wherever I've been. I've been in many places doing the tour, but he always told us, it doesn't matter how many cars you have, we didn't have any. It doesn't matter how many PlayStation, let's put it that way. It doesn't matter how many PlayStation you have, it doesn't matter how money you have, how much money, it doesn't matter how many houses you have. What matters the most is how many, how many life we can touch. How many lives before we go, we can touch and we can, we can make a difference. That's what the most important thing is. And I hope, I hope uh, the book does the work and helps and motivate and inspire a lot of parents and kids out there, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.